right, we're ready for Joshua chapters 20 and 21. Uh, Joshua's chapters 20 and 21. Let's review where we've been. Then we'll look at our outline and then we'll get underway with chapters 20 and 21. Chapter 1 was about Joshua prepares for the conquest. And then chapter 2 had to do with sending spies out to Jericho. And chapter 3 was the crossing of the Jordan. Chapter 4, the memorial stones, as they had crossed over the Jordan and set up stones in two different places. Chapter 5, once they get across to Gilgal, they circumcise the second generation, which is testimony they have not been doing what they should have been doing in the wilderness. Now we have the beginning of the conquest. It starts in chapter 6. There's the central campaign that starts with Jericho. There was an attempt at Ai that was failed, and then there was success at Ai after they corrected that in chapter 8. Then we have the treaty with the Gibeonites, then the conquest with the south in chapter 10, that is conquest of the south, the southern campaign, and then the northern campaign in chapter 11. And that basically conquered the, uh, the land of Palestine. Then we have in chapter 12 the list of the kings uh, that were conquered by Moses on the east side and Joshua on the west side of the Jordan River. Then you have the division of the land on the east. So starting in chapter 13, we have the division of the land and the settling out into the tribes. You have the division of the land, the land for Caleb at Hebron in chapter 14. Chapter 15, we have land given to Judah. So each tribe is now being assigned certain sections. In chapter 16, the land to Ephraim, and then we have to Manasseh in 17, and then to Benjamin in 18, and then we had to uh, Simeon, Zebulun, Issachar, Ash, Naphtali, Dan, and Joshua in uh, 19, and that's where we left off. Here is our outline that we're following. We're in the, obviously the last section after getting over the river, conquering the enemy. Now there is the uh, claiming of the inheritance, and within that, we're ready now to talk about the special cities appointed. Next time we'll be talking about the border tribes allotted, and then the last section, chapters 24, uh, 23 and 24, we'll get into the uh, uh, last admonition of Joshua. And uh, that reminds us a great deal of what we saw in the book of Deuteronomy, basically, and an encouragement to the people in uh, Joshua's last admonition. But the tribes have been settled, uh, as we have already seen. All these tribes have been settled into their territory. And the, the, uh, it's been mapped out and decided by lot. So what's happening now, that happened in 13 to 19. So in uh, 20 and 21, these are special cities that are appointed. So in chapter 20 is the uh, cities of refuge. Chapter 21 is the priestly cities. The c uh, cities for the Levites is what we're ready for now. So let's go to chapter 20 now. We're going to be tracing some other references. Uh, if you don't have a pen or a pencil, you might want to get that, and hopefully you'll make some marginal notes about some parallel text on the cities of refuge. At least it helps me, because each one gives a little different information about these cities of refuge. Um, Joshua 20, we're, we're going to talk about these passages over here. These are the four parallel passages. So at Joshua 20, this may be a good time to do that, write down these other three references Deuter uh, Numbers 35, we're going to go there in a minute, and verses 9 to 34, Deuteronomy 4, 41 to 43, Deuteronomy 19, 1 to 14. And then we have Joshua 20, but that's where you are, so you don't need to write Joshua 20 down in Joshua 20, you, you're already there. Uh, but anyway, put these three passages, and then when we get to those other passages, what we're going to do is write the other three down. And uh, that helps me, at least in my study, going back and forth. So here's what happens in chapter 20. Short chapter, nine verses, we have the cities of refuge that are being assigned that had been talked about in the Pentateuch. And we see the purpose and then the cities themselves. So let's go, let's start with, before we go to Joshua and spend some time there, let's go over to Numbers 35. And you have those same four passages up here listed in that little box. And so at Numbers 35, this might be a good time to write down the other three references besides Numbers 35. Um, so let's go over to Numbers 35. We're not going to read every verse in this section, verses 9 to 34. But this is an outline when we studied the book of Numbers. Um, and so this kind of tells us what's going on in the chapter. So let's talk about Numbers 35 just for a moment and what it says about the cities of refuge. We'll come back to Numbers 35, 1 to 8. That's the cities for the Levites. So beginning at verse 9, we have the cities of refuge. 
But before we get to verse 9, though, notice earlier there were six cities of refuge that were mentioned in verse 6 in the cities of the Levites. There was an overlapping of those cities, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. In other words, some of the cities assigned to the Levites were also cities that were cities of refuge, as you recall from reading Joshua 20 and 21. Well, you might make, take note of that at verse 6 of Numbers 35. Now, beginning at verse 9, I want to kind of scan this to see so that when we get over to Joshua, we understand why they're doing what they're doing in Joshua 20. So what happened in Numbers 35? Let's look at verses 9 to 15. Here are six cities that are set aside, and, and here's their purpose. Uh, notice at verse 13, well, verse 11 talks about their purpose. You shall appoint cities to be cities of refuge that a manslayer who kills any person accidentally may flee there. That was the purpose, as you remember from uh, Joshua 20, that if someone kills another person, he's called a manslayer, and he does that accidentally, not committing murder, not intentionally, but he does that accidentally, he would seek uh, refuge in this city that's called the city of refuge. Verse 12, these shall be the cities of refuge where, uh, uh, lost my place here, what is it? Verse 12, they shall uh, be cities of refuge for you from the avenger that the manslayer may not die. Now, who was the avenger? Apparently, it was either the next of kin of the person who was killed or it was someone the family appointed to go seek vengeance on the one who had caused their death. And so in order to escape that death, he could run to the city of, of refuge. Now notice at verse 15 now, verse 15, these six cities of refuge uh, for the children of Israel, for the stranger and for the sojourner uh, among them, that anyone who accidentally kills may flee there. Now notice at verse 16 to 21, if uh, I'm not going to read that, but the point here is if someone kills another on purpose, he's a murderer and he should die. And he doesn't escape to the city of refuge. He's not going to be uh, uh, protected in the city of refuge. Now, at verses 22 to 28, Moses had given the instructions that if one uh, accidentally kills another, they're not guilty and they should stay in the city. Notice that beginning at verse 22. If he pushes him suddenly without enmity or throws anything at him without lying in wait, or if he uses a stone by which he could die throwing it without seeing him, so that would describe two or three different circumstances under which an accidental death might take place, while he was not his enemy nor seeking him harm. In other words, it's not premeditated. Then the congregation shall judge between the manslayer and the avenger of blood. So as the avenger is trying to seek him, he goes to the city of refuge. They're going to basically put him on trial and they're going to judge between the manslayer and, uh, and the avenger and pass some judgment whether this was accidental or premeditated. Does he fit the category of verses 16 to 21 or does he, was it accidental? That's what, he's, what they're going to do. We'll see more about that in Joshua 20. Uh, now at verses uh, 29 through verse 34, we won't read that, the murderer should not go unpunished. In fact, he should die. And so that was our first introduction to the cities of refuge was in Numbers 35. So if you haven't already, jot down at Numbers 35, Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 19, and Joshua 20. Those are your parallel passages. So let's jump over now to Deuteronomy 4. This is still in the Pentateuch, but this is on the verge of crossing over into the land of Canaan. As Moses is preaching his sermons, and so this is in the, the first sermon. So let's go to Deuteronomy 4, very short section here. We don't learn a great deal about the cities of refuge. Um, so let's look at Deuteronomy uh, 4 and beginning at verse 41 uh, and through verse 43. Three of those cities are identified. They're not identified in Numbers 35. So in Deuteronomy 4, you might write down the other three passages there. Those are good references uh, to help us when we come to Deuteronomy 4 again. Uh, so Moses set apart three cities on this side of Jordan, and then identifies the three cities, tells verse, the purpose at verse 42, and then the three cities are Bezer, Ramoth, and Golan, which we're going to see identified a little bit later. So we're going to leave Deuteronomy 4, take the time to write down Numbers 35, 9 to 34, Deuteronomy 19, 1 to 14, and Joshua 20. Those are your parallel accounts. Now let's jump on over to the next account. We still have those same passages. And write down at Deuteronomy 19, 1 to 13, or 1 to 14, those other three passages there. And um, then we'll be ready to go into Joshua 20 in a moment. 
So let's jump over to Deuteronomy 19. Now there's a little more said at Deuteronomy 19 than obviously was said in Deuteronomy 4. So here we have mentioned the, the cities of refuge. And so let's notice verses 1 to 3. Verses 1 to 3 separate, I'm reading it verse 2, three cities for yourself in the midst of the land. But I want you to notice it in verse 3. Now this is not mentioned uh, in detail in Joshua 20 or in the other two texts. But you should prepare roads for yourself and divide them into three parts, the territory of your land which the Lord God has given you. Uh, now what, what's that, the point of that? Prepare, the, the roads were to be clear and free to the city of refuge. In other words, don't, don't build a city of refuge or, or, or have a city of refuge uh, where you can't get to it because the road is impassable. And don't let the roads get impassable, but keep the roads clear and free so that the manslayer could quickly flee there and get away from the avenger who may be after him to kill him. So now at verse uh, 4 beginning, through verse 7, here's the purpose of the cities, which we've already mentioned. And then notice again he mentions one who ever kills his neighbor unintentionally, not having hated him in time past. In other words, it's not premeditated. We'll say more about that in a moment. Some for instances are given at verse 5 and 6. For example, if an axe comes off, the, uh, slips off uh, uh, while you're cutting down a tree and the head slips from the handle and strikes the neighbor, that wasn't mentioned earlier, but something along that line, then you are free from that. Now, notice at verse 8 through verse 10, there were to be added three more cities that the Lord God had promised them, and of course that's conditional on uh, their, their receiving that land upon their, their faithfulness. Now, beginning at verse 11, one who kills intentionally is not safe in those cities. Same thing that we saw in Numbers 35. Now, all of that's the background to what we have over in Joshua 20. So let's go over to Joshua 20, and if you didn't do that a while ago, this would be a good time to write down these other three references, that Numbers 35, 9 to 34, Deuteronomy 4, 41 to 43, and Deuteronomy 19, 1 to 14. Those are your other passages that are going to help us, and there's going to be a little bit of information. Now, the purpose of doing that is not only to know where the other passages are, but you may come across uh, a comment, maybe in a commentary that says, X, Y, Z about these cities, and you say, I didn't read that in Joshua 20. They were probably picking that up from Deuteronomy 19 or Deuteronomy 4 or Numbers 35. So again, two things happen here. We have the purpose, and then we have the city. So let's talk about the purpose, only nine verses here. Uh, verses 1 to 4, if one kills unintentional, they were to flee to the city of refuge. I want you to notice at verse 2, this is where the reference is made and why we went back to those other references. Uh, the Lord spoke to Joshua and said to him, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, Appoint for yourselves cities of refuge of which I spoke to you through Moses. Numbers 35, Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 19. Uh, uh, Deuteronomy 19. That's the references. Uh, I had said that there were going to be cities of refuge, so go ahead and appoint cities of refuge. Now here's the purpose that the slayer who kills any person accidentally or unintentionally may flee there, and they shall be for your refuge from the avenger of blood. Now, we've already identified the avenger of blood is most likely the next of kin or someone who is appointed by the family. And uh, the for instances are not given here. That's why we went back to Numbers 35 and Deuteronomy 19. So if in some of those for instances fit and apply where you're doing something and uh, you accidentally kill someone where, or you throw a rock and uh, you didn't see them coming and it kills them. That when he flees to one of these cities and stands at the entrance of the gate, verse 4, and he declares his case in the hearing of the elders of the city, they shall take him into the city uh, as one of them, that is as one of their own, and give him a place to dwell among them. And so what was the purpose? He flees there for his safety. Now, that, now there's something is to be done now. And so he is to stay there, verses 5 and 6. This should say verses 5 and 6 here on point B, uh, until he's judged and the death of the high priest. So um, let's see what that says. Then if the avenger of blood pursues him, and he comes on and pursues him, uh, they shall not deliver the, the, uh, the slayer into his hand because he struck his neighbor unintentionally and because he did not hate him beforehand. It was not premeditated. Now verse 6, that he will dwell there until he stands before the congregation for judgment. Uh, so 
I don't know that that means the whole congregation, but before the elders or those whom they would appoint, the elders of the city would appoint, but they were to stand basically as tri on trial, according to verse 6. They'll dwell in the city until he stands before the congregation uh, for judgment. In other words, if they determine that he's claiming, if he, if he killed somebody intentionally, he most likely would lie about that, wouldn't he? And so he could be lying about, I, I killed a man unintentionally. And so they, they put him on trial until they, and they uh, uh, judge, and they judge him and find out if he's, he did this premeditated, then he ought to be, he's going to be punished and be killed himself. Um, but he's found innocent, and he's found that he is, uh, didn't do it in, intentionally. Then he stays there uh, until he's judged and until he's going to continue to stay there because he's innocent until the death of of the high priest in those days. Whoever the high priest is in that days, when he dies, then, then he's able to go back to his own house and to his own city. And that, that's where he'll stay. Now that's verses 1 to 6. The purpose of those cities. Now let's have them identified in verses 7 to 9. 7 to 9. For graded ages, you have a map like this that's blank, so fill in the cities. That's what your blank page is for. To fill in the cities that we have mentioned in 7 to 9. Now, these same cities are going to be identified as cities for the Levites, but notice how they're spaced out. Uh, so that, uh, let's suppose there's not Hebron and Shechem, and the closest one was Kedesh, and someone down here in Simeon uh, killed someone in unintentionally. He's got a long way he's got to go flee. So they were to be spaced out so that they could get to them quickly, and that's why we went back to those Old Testament references, I mean the uh, uh, Pentateuch references, because uh, of the mentioning of keeping the roads clear and making them uh, easily accessible. So now beginning at verse 7, uh, they appointed Kedish in Galilee. Uh, Kedish is uh, right up here. And so fill that in graded ages. K-E-D-E-S-H, Kedish in Galilee. Then there was Shechem, which was right below that. Uh, here is Shechem. Shechem in the mountains of Ephraim. And Kerjath Arba, which is Hebron. And so we label it here as Hebron, same city as mentioned as being uh, Kerjath, uh, Kerjath Arba. Now on the other side, and there's three on each side of the river of Jordan. So on, next, on the next side, at verse 8 through ver and 9, is the, uh, the ones on the east side. We have Bezer, Ramoth, and Gilead, and Golan. And so Golan was up here in Manasseh. And Ramoth Gilead is right here in the northern part of Gad, and then Bezer down here in Reuben. And those are your six cities of refuge. Um, now I'm going to leave that because I want to get into the cities of the Levites. Um, but here's something very practical I'm learning uh, from chapter 20. Saving his life, that is, if you were the uh, manslayer, saving your life, was conditional. Something think about that. And, and you obviously see the parallel to our own salvation. That it wasn't that his life was saved automatically. Well, I didn't, and I didn't uh, mean to do that. It was unintentional, and I've, I've, I've made a mistake, and I killed a man, and, and so I'm just un, unconditionally. No, no, he's not unconditionally saved. Uh, he stands around and just lollygags around. He's probably going to be killed by the avenger. So he has to take action and run and flee to the city of refuge. And there he has to stay. Um, because if he leaves the city of refuge, then indeed he is, um, uh, is going to be killed. We saw that. We didn't take the time, but you go back to Numbers 35. If he leaves the city of refuge, then uh, the avenger will kill him. All right. That's Numbers, I mean Joshua chapter 20, the cities of refuge. Uh, it's important to know that, not necessarily that we remember all of those, but we'll, we'll see references to the cities of refuge further in other places in the Old Testament. And so we just need to be familiar with what they were, where they were, and the purpose behind those. Go to Joshua 21. Joshua 21. Um, this is the city of uh, cities of the Levites. The cities of the Levites. Now, two things happen here. We have uh, the cities given to the Levites, verses 1 to 42. That's the bulk of the chapter. And it's much like the land. It's this city and 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 this city. And so we have the 48 cities that are listed there. And then there's the land promise that's fulfilled in verses 43 to 45. 
But before we do that, let's go back to Numbers 35. You might make a reference at Numbers 20, uh, Joshua 21, that Numbers 35 is talking about the cities of the Levites. So let's go back for a moment. We've got time to do that. Let's go to Numbers 35 again. This is the same outline we saw a moment ago when we were studying Numbers. And we talked we talk beginning at verse 9 about the cities of refuge. Let's talk about verses 1 to 8. Cities assigned to the Levites. And what that means and what that's about. Let's see what that is. So, um, I'm at Numbers 35 beginning at verse 1. Moses, uh, the Lord spoke to Moses in the plains of Moab. and said, command the children of Israel that they give the Levites cities to dwell in from, an inher- uh, from the inheritance of their possessions. And you shall also give the Levites common land around the cities. You're, James, which I'm using, we'll call it common lands. If you're using the King James, uh, it will say uh, suburbs. And I'm not sure what the English standard. Anybody have the English standard? Any man? English standard of that. It may say suburbs. I'm not sure. But anyway, that's what it's talking about. Um, so uh, let's, let's go a little further and, and make some sense of that. When we were in Numbers 35, we made the point that there's, there's 1,500 yards, basically the 1,000 uh, cubics, uh, that the common land that they were to be given was to extend out a thousand cubics, which that's 1,500 feet, 500 yards in other words. It seems that there was perhaps some 1,500 feet for cattle, and then there was another 1,500 feet maybe for their vineyards and their fields, which is mentioned at verse 5. So the point is they were not only given a city that they were to dwell in, but then there's the suburbs for their cattle and for their vineyards and for their, uh, their crops and their fields, etc. Now, within those cities, uh, verse 6, there were six cities of refuge to which the the fleer may go. And at verse 7, there would be 48 cities uh, that shall be given with all their common land. So the instructions were given when you get into the land. They haven't got there yet in Numbers 35. When you get there and settle in, you're going to need cities uh, for the Levites and cities of refuge. And that needs to be done. All right, let's go back to Joshua 21 now. Joshua 21, this is, you might uh, make a note over at Numbers 35 to see Joshua 21, and at Joshua 21, see Numbers 35, 1 to 8. Uh, so here's the cities that are going to be given, and we're going to, to identify them, uh, some of them at least. We're not going to give, get all of those. Uh, some of them can't be identified where they, uh, exactly where their location is. So we're not going to take forever to go through this, this list of names. Uh, But we're going to go through what we can of that. In verses 1 and 2, the Levites came and made request. Now, they're given cities basically for two reasons. One, they are uh, temple servants, and so God is rewarding those who are serving uh, in His service by giving them a place without giving them their own territory. Uh, Without going back and developing, a second point about that is that in Genesis 49, Jacob's curse upon Levi, you remember, had something to do with this in Genesis 49, verses 5 to 7, um, just for a, a, a reference. So in verses 1 and 2 now, the Levites came to Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and to the heads of the fathers of the tribes, and they spoke to them at Shiloh and said, The Lord commanded through Moses to give us cities to dwell in uh, with the common places for our livestock. Well, now you know where, where they're talking about, Numbers 35, 1 to 8. Uh, so they said, of course, they didn't call it numbers, but they said back in Moses' uh, writing, or back when Moses <clears throat> was among us, he gave us this commandment and said we're supposed to receive the cities. <clears throat> and uh, so Moses, verses 3 to 8, now Moses uh, divides the cities by families. And we'll talk about the significance of the families here in just a moment. So uh, the children of Israel gave the Levites their inheritance. And uh, now the lot came out for the Hoathites. Uh, Ho- Ho- <clears throat> And they were given 13 cities for those, notice, uh, and the children of Aaron the priest. We're going to make some sense of this in just a moment. And then the rest of of the children of Kohath were given 10 cities. And then at verse 6, the children of Gershon were given 13 cities. And then the children at verse 7, Merari, were given 12 cities. You add all those numbers and it comes to 48 cities like Numbers 35 said. All right, now, what we're going to see beginning at verse 9, 
Let me get the, a family tree here just for a moment. Give me a second to find that. Um, right here. <clears throat> that Levi had these three sons, Kohath, Gershon, and Merari. Kohath, Aaron came from Kohath, and it was the descendants of Aaron that were the priest. But all of those, if you were a descendant of Kohath, Gershon, and Merari, you were a Levite because you were a descendant of Levi. So that's the reason why, as we go back to our outline here, taking a, keeping that little graph in mind, that's the reason why that verses 9 to 19 talk about the, those who are the, of Kohath, who are of the, through Aaron, they got these, this many cities. But the other Kohath, uh, descendants of Kohath, that were non-Aaron, that is, they were not descendants of Aaron, they are still Levites, just like those of Gershon and Merari. Make sense? So that's the distinction uh, of what's, that's the kind of distinction that's being made in, in, in these chapters. Now, I want to look at verses 9 to 19 now, but let's, we'll start identifying the cities. Uh, our little legend up here, uh, I don't know if you can see that that well. Let's blow that up where you can see that. Our, our little uh, legend up here, we're going to talk about those of Kohath, and those are identified by a circle. I, uh, I'll let you figure out what color that is, because I have no clue. But uh, by the circle, and then the square has reference to uh, Gershon and Merari, uh, Merari's descendants uh, are with the triangle. So let's take that and go back to our map here. And uh, most of those are of Kohath are in this region. Not all, but most of them in this region. Most of those of the Merarites are over here, and most of those of uh, uh, Gershon are to the north. Now let's get kind of a picture, and uh, you may want to underline these and count them as we go, and we'll have all of those cities. Uh, we're, we're not, I'm not going to take the time to trace every one on the map. Uh, you can look up there, and, and I'll try to identify some of those as we go along. But beginning at verse 9, uh, the chapter talks about where the city was, in what region, um, Starting at verse 9, they gave the tribe of the children of Judah from the tribe of the children of Simeon, um, mentioned here by name, verse 10, which were the children of, of, of Aaron, the family of, of Kohath. And so now here we begin with the cities. There's Kerjath Arba. Um, there is Hebron, uh, which is Hebron. So that's the first one. The second one is Libna. The third is Jeter, verse 14, and Ashtamoah is the fourth. Holon is in verse 15. Debir is the sixth, and Ain is the seventh, and Judah is the eighth, and Beth Shemesh, that makes nine cities. So you should have nine at this juncture. Then you have those from Benjamin in 17 to 19. You have Gibeon and Giba and Anathoth and Almon, which makes up four cities. That makes the 13 cities for that part of the descendants of Kohath. All right, so basically the, here, here are some of the cities. We had Hebron mentioned, Debir mentioned. You remember that? Jatir mentioned. Uh, Eshtemoa mentioned. Um, Geba mentioned. Um, those are some of the cities that are right in this region. Those are the cities of the Levites of uh, the tribe of Benjamin and of the tribe of Judah and Simeon. Now let's start at verse 20. Verse 20 to 26 deals with those of Kohath that are non-Aaron. That is, those who are not of the descendants of Aaron. And so you're going to have 10 cities that are mentioned here. You have Shechem, and you have uh, verse 2, Gezer, and you have uh, uh, Kidzim, and Beth Horon, and that should be four, and the fifth is Eltica. Um, anybody else want to correct me on these names? You're welcome to do that. Um, Gibbethon, and Agilon, and Gathrimon. Uh, that makes eight, and Tanak, and Gathrimon. Again, mentioned, that's not the same city. In verse um, 25, that makes ten of those cities. Now, 
you might take note over here that here's some cities that we don't have, and uh, Gathrim, uh, there's one of those that we do know where it is, but then this one we don't know, um, don't seem to know where the, those four cities are, are located. Uh, let's keep going here. Let's get those of Gershon. If you're making notes in the margin of your Bible, 25, uh, 27 to 33, those of the descendants of Gershon, there's Golan, and, um, and then there is the Estera, and Kishon, and Dabaroth, and Jarmuth, and uh, in Ganium, and Mishul, and Abdon, and Hilka, and Reba, that makes ten. And then there's three more mentioned, Kedish, Hamath, and Kartan. Kartan is, uh, is um, our, uh, Karta is one of the cities that we, we don't know exactly where that city is located. Now that makes thirteen. Now, verses 34, uh, 34 to 40, there's 12 more cities that are mentioned. And um, without naming every one of those, those are of the descendant, for the descendants of Merari. And most of those are, um, are right over here. Most of those are right in this region of, of Gad and, um, and Reuben and Gad is where they are that are mentioned. Zebulon, there's some in Zebulon. Um, and then there's Reuben and Gad. So those are the 48 cities in total. Notice at verse 41, you might underline the 48 cities. Um, now, what have I learned so far? Well, what we're about to learn in the last section is God fulfilled his promise and God did what he said. And so those are the 48 cities that were the Levitical cities. Now, I don't expect you uh, to remember every one of those and where they're located. But I just want to introduce us to the concept and that there, there must be some value in knowing that or God wouldn't have recorded it for us in, uh, in two different references. You might also note in 1 Chronicles chapter 6, 54 to 81, of, that's up here uh, on this map right here, that's also a parallel account to that. Now you'll find different spellings of some of the names, so don't get excited when you get over there and you make a list of the names. I doubt anyone's going to do that. If you make the list of all the names in... Um, Joshua 21 and make a list of all the names over in 1 Chronicles 6. They don't mash, uh, mesh. And some of that has to do with spelling. Uh, and we'll talk more about that when we get to 1 Chronicles 6, about that dis seeming discrepancy there. All right. Now let's go further and let's talk about the land promise being fulfilled. This is a very important section. Short section, but it's a very important section. You might make a uh, cross-reference to chapter 2314. We're not going to turn there at the moment. We'll, we'll, when we get to 2314, we'll make a reference back over to this. But Joshua 2314 makes a similar point. Verse 43, very important. You might underline that the Lord gave to Israel, the next word is very important, all, all the land of which he swore to give to their fathers, and they took possession of it and dwelt in it. And so the Lord gave them rest all around, and not, not a one of their enemies stood against them, and the Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. Now, verse 45, not a word failed of any good thing the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. All came to pass. Now, it would, if God had made a promise, I'm going to give you this land, and I'm going to give you 48. In fact, he had said long before they got there, I'll give you 48 cities of refuge, and we'll give you six cities, I mean, six cities of refuge and 48 cities for the Levites. It would have been amazing had God given them most of this land, uh, four-fifths of this land, and gave them five cities of refuge and gave them 40 cities for the Levites. That would have been amazing. God did most of what he said. But then God wouldn't have done what he promised. But God gave them exactly what he promised to give them. Gave them every bit of the land, and he gave them exactly six cities, and gave them exactly 48 cities. Um, now that's interesting. Now, what's the importance of that? Let's go to our questions. We haven't been keeping up with that. Um, but let's go to question number eight. How does 2143 answer the premillennial view that land promise is yet to be fulfilled when the Jews uh, return to Palestine? Uh, the reason I, I emphasize that when we came across that in verse 43 and 45 is because of the premillennial view. Most of our religious friends... By that, I, I don't know how to, to guess, but I'm going to say 80% of our religious uh, friends in denominationalism, that a large percentage of them at least, believe in some form of millennialism. 
most believe in the premillennial view. And this premillennial view says, and you hear this in political talk, um, and it, particularly those who have a kind of a religious bent. This, what I'm about to say is not a political statement. Jimmy Carter uh, probably was more biblical uh, because he taught Bible class for years when he was president. But he, he was constantly talking about favoring the Jews in, in Israel. But he wasn't doing it from a political vantage point. It's because he thought the promise of the land given to, to Israel was yet to be fulfilled. Because the premillennialists believe that the land of Palestine belongs to Israel because of the promise and it's yet to be fulfilled. So Israel's going to come back and inherit that land when Jesus comes back and sets reign on earth. And so the Jews are all going to return to Palestine. And so there shouldn't be any Arabs there. There shouldn't be anybody else there. There shouldn't be anybody occupying the land because we need to favor Israel because of the promise. And what we do politically with, do we favor Israel, do we favor the Palestinians, or do we favor the Arabs who occupies the land has nothing to do with the promise because this promise has been fulfilled. That's the point. There is no promise that Jews are coming back to Palestine. So go back to verse 43. The Lord gave them all the land, and not a word has failed. The promise is not yet to be fulfilled. The promise has been fulfilled. There was another promise God made, that if you sin, you're going to lose it. And they did. And so uh, Assyria came in and took hold of the land. Um, Babylon came in and took hold of the land. And then later the Romans uh, controlled the land. And uh, Israel may, uh, the nation of Israel, not the same Israel here, but the nation of Israel may occupy it now, but that has nothing to do with God's promises. So if I favor Israel, it's for political. Or if I don't favor Israel, it's for political purposes. It has nothing to do with the, the fulfillment of this text for what that may be worth to us. All right, uh, let's wind up with some practical things and then we're going to stop. Um, let's list some practical lessons that we learn here. Uh, I learned from these chapters the difference in intentional and unintentional killing. Uh, God makes that distinction. And, um, and so there's a difference in first degree murder and intentionally killing somebody and accidentally killing somebody. Uh, you may accidentally kill somebody in a car accident. You may even get ch charged with manslaughter. That's not the same as murder, not the same thing. I, I learned of the value of human life from these chapters because the one who intentionally took the life of another, they ought to pay the price. Uh, and so there's the value of human life taught in the Cities of Refuge story. Motive makes all the difference in the world. I learned that, that from chapter 20. So it's not just a list of, of the cities, but I'm learning motive makes a difference. And so it, it, the fact he, ki he threw a rock and killed him is, is the same whether it was intentional or unintentional. The end result is the same. The man was killed. But the motive made a difference. Did he intend to kill him or did he intend to throw the rock and didn't know he was coming? Motive makes all the difference in a number of things, but especially here in that case. Number four that vengeance must be executed God's way. In other words, uh, the man was to be tried, he's, he's to be judged, and then if he's found to be guilty of murder, then he's to be executed and has to be done God's way. You don't just take uh, vengeance yourself. Uh, so vengeance must be executed God's way. We see that in Romans 12 and Romans 13 as we tie them together. I see emphasis on the family because it was divided by families uh, in the uh, uh, Levitical cities. It was by family, so those of Kohath uh, get these cities, and those of uh, Gershon get these cities, and those of um, Arari get these cities. Number um, six, God provides for those who serve. Chapter 21, the Levites. Uh, we see that in 1 Corinthians 9, a, even today. And then God does what he promises. That gives assurance to us, and those, no land promise yet to be fulfilled. And on we go with some perhaps other studies, uh, other practical things from the study as well. But that's Joshua 20 and 21, the cities of refuge and the uh, Levitical cities. And then the promise has been fulfilled. So if you didn't underline, you might underline uh, that last section, some, that all the land has been fulfilled because we're going to come back to that when we get to chapter 23 and 24 a little bit later. We'll stop there and pr proceed with our announcements and the rest of our service.